everybody is in. We got some folks getting connected. Um, good afternoon from the East Coast, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. My name is Tiana Ingram. I use she, they pronouns. I am the programming coordinator for the Office of Multicultural Student Affairs in Richmond, Virginia. Um, I have some lovely guests here with me today. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. So Hiba, I will go ahead and pass the mic to you and put myself on mute. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tiana. Um, really happy to be here today. My name is Hiba Mohammed, um, and I will be the facilitator for today's event. Um, we have a fairly packed schedule, and um, so I'm just going to go ahead and jump right into the program. Um, first, I want to thank you all for joining us for this Palestine 101 event. Um, I would love for folks, if you um, have the opportunity and know how to, to update your Zoom name to include your full name and pronouns. Um, if you're not sure how to do that, you know, just go ahead and like scroll over your own video screen and click on the three dots in the top right corner, you should see an option to rename yourself, um, just so we know who is with us and know how to address you properly. Um, as we get started with today's event, I would be remiss if I didn't begin by thanking the VCU Office of Multicultural Student Affairs for supporting today's program and by thanking um, the Lebanese Student Association and the Muslim Student Association for co-sponsoring this event. So thank you all for your support with this. Um, before we jump into the program itself, I want to share some general ground rules for this Zoom program. I already mentioned that we'd love for you to update your name to include your pronouns. So um, if you haven't done so yet, please take some time to do that. Um, secondly, we are asking everyone to remain on mute. Um, it should be set up that you're unable to unmute yourself, um, but if for some reason you are able to, just please stay on mute. Um, we wanna make sure that all of the participants are able to hear the program. And if you accidentally unmute, that might disrupt that. Um, third, I just want to note that the chat box is off right now. At the end of the event, we will have plenty of time for questions, at which point we will turn the chat box on. Um, so just encourage you to take notes if questions come up during the program so at the end you can post those to us using the chat box. Um, so those are the ground rules for today, um, just to help us run a smooth program. With all that being said, uh, I now want to give you a quick overview of what to expect from the, from the event. We are scheduled for 90 minutes, and we're going to focus this event on giving a broad overview of what's happening, happening in Palestine today and how you can help. As the event title suggests, this is a 101 style event to give folks an introduction to Palestine. Um, I recognize that there will be differing levels of knowledge in this room, um, although I feel very confident in saying that every person here will take something away with them, no matter how well versed you are on what's happening in Palestine. Um, we're going to start with a brief overview of Palestinian history, followed by um, information about the present day illegal apartheid occupation of Palestine. From there, we're gonna hear um, testimony from a Palestinian who is living under occupation before turning to the uh, discussion about domestic implications in the United States of the Israeli occupation of Palestine. Um, we're gonna close the prepared remarks by giving you suggestions on action you can take to support the liberation of Palestine and to end the Israeli occupation. Um, again, we will have time at the end for Q&A, so please save your questions for that moment um, where you will then be able to drop them in the chat. Okay, now to my favorite part of this, which is the introduction of our speakers. We have a stellar panel of speakers who are really some of the best people I know and folks that I admire quite a bit. Um, so first, please meet Arij Masood. Arij serves as the program director and lead educator at Khayari, which means my choice, the Women's Leadership and Economic Empowerment Initiative. She is also the community coordinator to visiting pilgrims with experience mission and is a co-facilitator for the wisdom-based leadership for social transformation with the Ignite Institute and the Pacific School of Religion. Through her experience in communication, development, and advocacy, Arij has developed a deep commitment to social transformation that stems from her belonging to faith communities, such as Christ at the Checkpoint and Kairos Palestine. Arij takes action toward change, through the active work within the community she belongs to, and by raising awareness and promoting Palestinian struggles during local and public engagements. Um, I wanna take this moment too to note and also apologize because I misspelled Arija's last name on the promotional materials. It is Masood with one S, not two. So I wanna say that out loud on the record. Um, I apologize for that. And thank you Arija for being here with us. 
Um, next, I'll introduce Omar Badad. Omar is a Palestinian American political analyst, digital producer, and human rights advocate based in Washington, DC. He is the co-host of the podcast, This is Palestine, which is great, you should listen to it. Um, previously, he served as deputy director of the Arab American Institute, a producer with Al Jazeera, and the executive director of the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee of Massachusetts. He holds a master's degree in political science with research focusing on US policy toward Palestine and Israel. He has participated in dozens of panels, lectures, and debates on college and university campuses throughout the US. His media appearances include the BBC, MSNBC, Al Jazeera, Sky News, Voice of America, and other outlets. And his writings have appeared in Newsweek, Salon, HuffPost, The Daily Beast, and Jadalia, among other platforms. Omar, we're so glad that you're here with us today. And our third and final speaker, saving the best for last, is Samer Khalif, who currently serves as the president of the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, which is the largest Arab American civil rights organization. He has also has the honor of serving on the board of directors of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Prior to joining the ADC, Samer was an associate with Barnes, Icarino, and Shepard, I hope I said that right, um, where he specialized in union side labor law and ERISA, which I don't know what that means, but if you're a lawyer and know what that means, I'm sure it's really important. <laughs> he received his BA in political science from VCU and his JD with a certificate in law and public policy from the Catholic University uh, of America in Washington, DC. Samer has a long history of public service, especially in his home state of New Jersey, where he was the co-founder and co-chair of the New Jersey Arab American Democratic Caucus and has been appointed to several state commissions. Samer, thank you for all of your work on behalf of the Arab American community and for joining us today. Um, I promise I will stop talking soon, but the first part of this program um, is my responsibility, which is to give you a summary of the significant historical events in Palestine. Um, you know, as someone who spends a lot of time talking to others about Palestine, a statement that I often get from people is, you know, well, I just don't know enough about the history to be comfortable saying anything about the conflict, or, you know, it's just too complicated. Um, I have heard that a lot, and I heard it especially in May 2021, when Israel significantly, significantly escalated its violence against Palestinians by bombing Gaza and working to forcibly displace Palestinians in East Jerusalem. Um, in response to all of that violence, Palestinians and our allies were building online support for the cause to spread awareness. Uh, and I could tell that I was not the only one getting that kind of feedback from people, which is why I think it's so important that we address some of the historical events in today's discussion um, as a 101, as part of the 101 discussion. Um, it will not be the sole focus of this event, though. The history is obviously important, and I definitely don't want to dismiss anyone's interest in knowing it. Um, but I also don't want you to think that you have to be an expert in the history of what happened in order to engage uh, in what's happening presently in Palestine, because frankly, there are a lot of clear cut atrocities and human rights violations happening today um, that you don't need to know the history about in order to just tell that there are crimes against humanity being committed against Palestinians. So I took a lot of notes on this, but I'm gonna to try to keep it brief um, and just hit on the big points of what has happened in the last um, you know, century or so. Um, so just so we're all on the same page, late 1800s is when the uh, political Zionist ideology is birthed. The goal of this movement is to establish a Jewish state and to garner support from other nations to legitimize the state. Um, in 1947, the UN proposes a partition plan to create two countries in Palestine, one for Palestinians and one as Israel. Um, pre-1947, pre-World War I, under Ottoman control, but there was already a lot of Jewish immigration happening to Palestine. Um, and you know, that was a part of this, this whole movement, uh, Zionist movement. In May of 1948, Israel declares its independence, which leads to the Nakba, um, which in Arabic translates to the catastrophe. This week um, is the annual commemoration of the Nakba, which is observed on May 15th. Um, I say it was the start of the Nakba because many Palestinians will tell you the Nakba has not ended. Um, it has continued through ongoing Israeli policy um, to oppress and subjugate Palestinians and to you know, put us through um, the occupation that's happening currently. Um, 1948 to 49, the Arab-Israeli war happens. Um, Arab nations are not happy about this partition. No one wants um, the land to be partitioned. They want it all to be under Palestine. Um, Israel wins the war and claims even more land that was meant for Palestine under the 47 partition plan. 
Skipping ahead, a lot of years here. Again, this is brief, hitting on the high points. 1967, the Six Day War happens, where a coalition of Arab countries um, attack Israel after years of conflict and tension between nations uh, leads up to this point. Again, Israel wins the war and occupies all of the Palestinian territories, including parts of Syria and Egypt as well. Jumping ahead again, 1987, after decades of no progress on peace and resolution, the first intifada happen, happens. Intifada in Arabic means uprising. Um, and it occurs because Palestinians are continuing to be occupied and oppressed. Um, it's important to note that, you know, I, I leapt in time here, but in, in the interim, um, Israeli settlements are being built on Palestinian land, which just makes it even harder um, to envision an independent Palestine and causes even deeper problems um, with Palestinians. In 1988, um, the Palestinian Liberation Organization accepts UN resolutions to recognize the state of Israel. Um, in 2000, the second intifada or uprising begins. Um, again, a lot has happened here. I'm sorry that I'm just running through this. There will be time for questions if you have it or want more details, uh, but these are the high points. Um, one of the final pieces I'll mention is in 2005, Israel withdraws from Gaza and removes all of its settlements there. Um, however, it's important to note that Israel also imposes a blockade on Gaza uh, that makes Gaza today, in effect, an open-air prison and a regular target of Israeli bombings and violence whenever Israel wants to quell Palestinian resistance. Um, so that is where I'm going to stop um, in terms of the history and the lead up to all of this, um, which becomes an excellent transition point to Omar, um, who's going to talk to us about present day conditions in Palestine. Um, Omar, really top of mind for me is defining today's occupation so that we're all on the same page. Um, in the past two years, we've seen two reports from top human rights organizations, um, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, that define the occupation as apartheid. Um, so maybe to start, what can you tell us about the political and social life conditions on the ground that make Israel an apartheid state? All right. First of all, thank you so much, uh, Hiba, and to Tiana as well for making this event possible. And Hiba, honestly, your introduction is is um, so thorough. Uh, I think I would like to hit just a couple of pieces of it um, before I get into modern day apartheid, if that's okay. Just to reiterate something that you mentioned that I think is really, really important, which is the extent to which people always talk about this as a complicated issue and talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as if it's not a case of a blatant oppression um, in the way that a lot of, you know, if Palestine were taught accurately, you'll notice that nobody refers to Jim Crow segregation as the black-white conflict, right? Because to call it the black-white conflict implies parity that doesn't actually exist. One side is the oppressor, another side is the oppressed population. And so it's not really a conflict at all. And it's really similar that in spite of the fact that the term Palestinian, Israeli-Palestinian conflict is, is really common, it does serve to obscure how blatant the injustice that Israel imposes on Palestinians is. Um, to that effect, it's worth mentioning that when Israel was created in 1948, it got created at the expense of more than 750,000 Palestinians who were driven out of their homes. It was ethnic cleansing. So while many people celebrate Israel's creation as in the birth of a new nation, it came at the expense of another people. So when we talk about Zionism in the abstract, the idea of a Jewish homeland, there is nothing wrong with that idea in the abstract, the concept of creating a Jewish state. However, when people already exist and live somewhere in our homeland um, continuously for many, many, many generations, spanning back thousands of years, to want to create a Jewish state that necessitates displacing a people who already live there, that is the crime. And that is the problem, is that Palestinians existed, the land was not empty. And the ethnic cleansing that took place in the creation of Israel is a crime. And the Palestinians who've been displaced remain refugees to this day, along with their descendants. Um, one of the ways in which, you know, talking about modern day apartheid, the word apartheid for some of the younger folks who are not around when the, first, when the term got popular, it was a reference to essentially Jim Crow segregation that existed in South Africa. It was a time in which the white colonizers had full rights and the black indigenous population in South Africa did not. They could not live in certain neighborhoods. They could not walk on certain streets. Um, they could, you know, just the variety of rights that they were denied essentially just really encompassed almost every right that you can think of. And the situation is very similar today in Palestine. Um, 
you have a situation in which Israel was recognized by the UN as a state in all the areas that we mentioned where Palestinians were ethnically cleansed, but then Israel went on to capture more territories in the 1967 war, capturing the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. And the entire world agrees that Israel's capture of these territories is illegal. There was a UN resolution that said that Israel is obligated to withdraw from those territories. And ever since then to today, more than 50 years, more than half a decade, Israel has not only refused to withdraw from those territories, but has actually expanded and solidified its control by building more and more Israeli settlements. Um, and while they're building those settlements, they are actually destroying Palestinian homes um, and throwing Palestinians out of their homes in many cases in East Jerusalem. There are news pieces in which you literally see Israeli settlers show up to Palestinian homes, grab their belongings, throw them out under the protection of Israeli police and the Israeli military, so that Jewish settlers can come and take over those very homes. So we're watching that ethnic cleansing happen in real time. And there are videos that are also available that show Palestinians being stopped on the street by Israeli soldiers. And they ask, are you Jewish? And the Palestinian responds, no, I'm not. And they say, well, you can't walk here. You have to go a different way. Um, you have a situation in which the overwhelming of Pal majority of Palestinian water 80% of Palestinian water in the occupied West Bank. Again, to reiterate, this is an area of the Palestinian territories that Israel is not entitled to at all under international law, and the entire world agrees that Israel has to withdraw from the West Bank. And yet, 80% of the water that Israel gets from the West Bank, it uses for itself and for settlements, and gives Palestinians only 20% of their own water. So you have a situation in which an illegal Jewish settlement built on top of Palestinian land has a swimming pool, and a nearby Palestinian town has a shortage of water where people can't get enough to drink or enough out of the faucet. That is modern day apartheid. As, as Hiba mentioned, it's been acknowledged by the, uh, all the leading human rights organizations, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch. It's been even acknowledged by Israeli human rights organizations like B'Tselem. Um, and it's also acknowledged by the United Nations. So there is consensus on the fact that Israel is committing the crime of apartheid against Palestinians. And in the case of Gaza, it's even more extreme because Gaza is cut off completely from the outside world. Palestinians living in Gaza cannot leave Gaza, except in very rare circumstances by Israeli permission. And if you want to get a sense of how oppressive an existence that is, all you have to do is imagine the opposite scenario. Imagine if Israelis were trapped and they had to get permission from Hamas before they could leave Tel Aviv to travel anywhere in the world. The world would just go nuts over something like that. It just would not be acceptable. And yet when Palestinians are dehumanized and Palestinians are treated like prisoners in their own homeland and held captive, that is treated as if it's okay. And oh, it's complicated and it's a conflict and it's okay and let's talk about it. Um, that is really an ongoing problem. And then you have a second tier of apartheid that is a little bit less extreme, but it exists nonetheless. And that's within Israel as recognized by the international community itself. So the Palestinians who remained, when Israel ethnically cleansed hundreds of thousands of Palestinians, some actually stayed put. They resisted the violence, they ignored the massacres and insisted on staying home. And for those Palestinians, they hold Israeli citizenship, but they are second class citizens where there are more than 60 laws that discriminate against Palestinian citizens of Israel. For example, the Israeli Knesset, which is their parliament, votes every, you know, quite frequently, the, the few Palestinian citizens of Israel who are members of the Knesset bring forward a bill that calls for defining Israel as a country for all of its citizens. And that bill is defeated regularly and sometimes not even allowed to be brought to the floor for a vote at all because the law of the land in Israel is that Israel is a state that explicitly privileges the rights of Jewish citizens over non-Jewish citizens. There are cases where we know that in a place like the United States, if you want to go live in a neighborhood, if you're told you're the wrong race, you can't live here, you would immediately sue. I mean, we know obviously racism exists everywhere, but over there, it is actually legalized where there are housing admission committees that are approved by the Israeli Supreme Court that basically decide whether you are, quote, culturally suitable for a particular neighborhood if you want to live there. And that's really code to being Jewish or not Jewish and whether you can live in certain neighborhoods. So that's also an ongoing practice for Palestinian citizens. 
And then obviously you have the question of the issue of refugees, where anybody who is Jewish anywhere in the world has the right to become an Israeli citizen. So even people who don't have direct connections to the land, even people who have spent many, many, many generations growing up in other countries have the right to migrate to Israel and in many cases live in homes that once were owned by Palestinians. Meanwhile, Palestinian citizens, uh, Palestinians who have been displaced by Israel and are still living in refugee camps are denied the right to return to their homes. And on top of this blatant discrimination, you have the fact that Israel regularly commits war crimes against Palestinians. Um, those include every crime that you can imagine, this, the, the bombing of civilian areas, um, the shooting of unarmed demonstrators, uh, denying you know, people access to, to their families, separating Palestinian towns, it's, it's, it's really quite monstrous. And there are episodes in which it looks particularly awful. Back in 2014, when Israel decided to launch a massive campaign against Gaza, they killed more than 500 children in the span of a month by dropping bombs on residential areas. Now, I mentioned all of this, and I think that here there probably is a point to be made about um, media coverage of all this, because anybody who's watching news today is looking at the events that are unfolding in Ukraine and quite frankly, it is stunning the extent to which the American media can actually do its job. You know, you're watching the suffering of people who are living under a foreign military invasion and bombardment. And you see the news media speaking about it honestly and openly. You see all these calls from the around the entire world amplified by American media about the need to isolate Russia because of its invasion of Ukraine and how there has to be consequences for that invasion. By contrast, even though Israel's occupation of Palestine has been going on for many decades, even though these crimes are not just a few weeks old, but are decades old, the coverage is very, very different. Um, American media really distorts, it, the context is missing from everything that we're watching. So you'll hear about Palestinians throwing rocks and Israeli police shooting or beating or whatever, without telling you that you are looking at a situation of an illegal occupation where Israel is not the legitimate ruling authority and where the entire world is demanding that Israel withdraws from the Palestinian territories. And when you miss that context of illegal occupation, you miss half, you know, most of the picture. It just, it's, it's hard to understand what you're looking at if you don't understand the context of the fact that one side is a foreign military that is illegally present in somebody else's home. Um, you have the problem of when the clock arbitrarily starts. This year was an example. There were some Palestinian um, attacks in Tel Aviv, and suddenly the media paid attention here. It was this big thing about how there are these Palestinian attacks, and Israel must respond, and Israel is responding, ignoring the fact that dozens of Palestinians have been killed by the Israeli military before there were any Palestinian attacks, just in this year. So you see periods in which violence, daily violence against Palestinians, which is completely normalized, is treated as a low, as if it's not worthy of coverage. But then the second there is any kind of Palestinian violence, which doesn't come to a fraction of the daily violence that Israel imposes, that suddenly becomes newsworthy. And that's when the clock starts. And that becomes the entire context for the coverage, which is very, very distorting to the reality. Um, you have the problem of demonizing Palestinian resistance to occupation in a way that if you look at you know, Ukrainians throwing Molotov cocktail at, at Israeli, uh, at, at Russian armored vehicles, that's celebrated in American media as an act of heroism. And yet when similar acts happen in the Palestinian territories where Palestinians are resisting um, and engaging in rock throwing at, at Israeli uh, tanks or police cars or whatever, that's viewed as, you know, unprovoked violence and, and, and what have you. So you have that problem as well. And lastly, you have the problem of Palestinians being dehumanized to the point to where their deaths are merely numbers rather than actual real people. We see a situation in which when Israelis are killed, there is a human story, there is a human connection, there is a review of what their life was like, who their family was, and yet Palestinians who are killed at far, far greater numbers on a regular basis, they are simply statistics. You know, Last week, X many number of Palestinians were shot or whatever. And it's always taken with a grain of salt with Palestinian sources report in a way that the Israeli military, which is obviously 
no different than Russian military reports about what's happening in Ukraine, um, that gets taken at face value and reported as fact without any disclaimers. And the last thing I'll say here, and I don't wanna go on for, for too long because I think it would be useful to have um, a discussion at the end of everybody's talk. I'll just say that the fundamental issue, the reason why we're talking about this today, even though there are problems in many, many parts of the world, there are oppressed people all over the world, there are governments committing crimes all over the world, what makes this issue deserving of our attention is the fact that Israel cannot do this without the support of the U.S. government. It's the fact that the United States gives Israel more than $3.8 billion with a B every single year in military funding. That is more funding than any other country in the entire world has ever received from the United States. We talk about a country that has been protected by the US veto at the UN Security Council, something like 45 times since the 1970s. That means that every time the international community tries to step forward to hold Israel accountable for its crimes, the US steps in and vetoes those resolutions to make sure that there cannot be international action to hold Israel accountable. Again, for context, that is more vetoes than all vetoes cast by all other members of the UN Security Council combined on all issues for that same period. So we have a fundamental problem in the fact that our government allows another government to commit grave abuses and human rights violations, to commit the crime of apartheid among many other crimes against humanity. And that is allowed to happen only because our government does not stand up to them. And while that is changing right now, we are seeing a shift in American public opinion. We are seeing more and more members of Congress who are willing to speak out about this and demand something different, we still remain far away from the day where we're going to see a fundamental and real change in policy. And that's precisely the work that progressive people of conscience have to fight for in order to make our foreign policy stand in closer alignment to the values that we profess, values of democracy and freedom and human rights. If those words mean anything, then they have to be connected to a foreign policy that does not enable that. And we have to support a fight for freedom, support the Palestinian fight for freedom from Israeli oppression and occupation. Um, I'll stop right here, Hiba, and, and happy to talk some more afterwards. Thank you so much, Omar. I took a bunch of notes because even I am gonna be taking away a lot from, from this event. Um, and I will have some questions for you, but we'll save that to the end and we'll give everyone a chance to ask questions. So thank you for that really thorough overview. Um, always very impressed by your composition when you're sharing these very difficult things um, and realities for Palestinians. Um, thank you again, Omar. I'm gonna turn it over now to Arish who um, is living in the occupied West Bank and will be able to share with us the realities of living under occupation. Um, so Omar did a beautiful job talking about, um, you know, a lot of these pieces, um, not necessarily in the abstract, but I can't think of a better phrasing right now, but Arij will be able to place the personal context into everything that Omar was just talking about. So Arij, I'm going to turn it over to you to begin wherever you'd like. You are, um, yeah, you're the expert on this. Thank you, Hiba. Um, yeah, I'm, I would say I'm an expert in sense of living here, which is a sad uh, reality, sort of. But thank you, Omar, for uh, pinpointing more important issues and everything is relatable to what I experienced, what's going on in Palestinian reality. Um, as maybe most of you uh, know that um, recently we've celebrated Easter and Ramadan. Uh, it's, it's, it's a rare overlap between Ramadan, Passover, and Easter um, that happened last month, which reflects the religious richness of the land, but it also reflects intensity and reality of living under occupation, where religious freedom is restricted and sometimes is, it's non-existent. Uh, at many stages during holidays, Muslims, for example, were asked to step aside while uh, allowing Jews to enter for prayers while Palestinian Christians are asked to step aside to allow tourists priority entry to the Holy Sepulchre. And you probably, or you could find easily on social media videos that showed um, how discriminative those asks were. I myself have never prayed in the Holy Sepulchre during Easter uh, yeah, for, for many reasons. I either didn't have a permit to cross the checkpoint from Bethlehem to go pray, even though Jerusalem is 
sometimes even less than 15 minutes away from where I live. Or I, um, I, um, the checkpoints were closed during the um, holidays. They just to take, decide to take a break. Or Israeli soldiers will be slowing down movement because they know it's, an, it's a special occasion. Um, and if I do make it to Jerusalem, I might not be allowed to enter the church. And um, as I have mentioned, um, in the last holiday, they've literally, a soldier stopped and asked Palestinians who, like, whoever is here to celebrate Easter and speaks Arabic, stand on this side, while everyone else, you can stand on this side and actually pass. Um, and which was insulting, which was, of course, this is... Um, um, ethnic discrimination, this just shows how targeted Palestinians are. So if just going to pray with the spirit is something um, I, would, I would avoid as well. So that could be, an, that is another reason why I avoid even going to pray. And I always wonder during holidays and, um, and such times, is the Holy Land still holy? And what defines holiness? where I'm proud to be part of the Holy Land, but it, does it still hold that spiritual component? Um, the checkpoint doesn't only limit freedom of movement between the Palestinian West Bank and occupied lands. It also infests into Palestinian land, taking over, as Omar said, Palestinian resources like water and land. Um, for example, that just that, like the last past week, we've got water. Uh, my family and I, we were checking water meter, meters every day because we didn't get water for 20 days and summer has already started here. We were checking, we got a storm dust, everything was covered with um, um, dust all around here. We needed to clean everything. We have allergies, we have health issues, but we couldn't because we couldn't have water. Yet as Omar pointed, uh, settlers and neighborhood, um, Israeli neighborhoods, get 80% of that water, while we had to wait and keep checking our water meter, as if our rights to water is something, um, is not a right, it's, it's something we have to wait patiently to get and to, uh, to plan our lives around. The separation wall also separates um, uh, villages from each other, restriction, restricting movements, and the wall being built on Palestinian lands literally separated families. I know families who have been used to walk like five minutes from each other's house and the wall just got built right in between where now it's a very long detour and to go to those houses, it could take hours that if the family has permit to go beyond the separation wall. So the same Palestinian family could have different formal identification um, the wall separation and how Palestinians have been uh, separated ba based on um, geographical locations. Some Palestinians have Palestinian ID and a Palestinian travel document. Some Palestinians, like myself, have a Palestinian ID and a Jordanian passport. Some Palestinians have an Israeli ID and a Jordanian passport, or an Israeli ID and an Israeli passport. But yet, also as Muammar mentioned, those Palestinians with Israeli passports, with Israeli ID, are treated as second-class citizens. Um, while a friend of mine, for example, she has an Israeli ID and a Jordanian passport, but she lived in, her, in Jerusalem her whole life. She was born there, raised there. She went to get her master's degree in the US. So she left for two years and she was not even alerted, she was surprised to know that there's danger that she would lose her citizenship, her Jerusalemite status, where, which she means she would be homeless if that happened and she didn't urgently left her place where she's studying and had to go back and save the situation and make sure her home and her identity and her um, uh, ID is still her own. And it's it's too difficult. It's almost impossible to unite families who have different sets of ideas. ID system in Palestine is too complex, making life impossible. For example, another example of my friends who are close friends of mine, uh, my friend, uh, my Palestinian friend married a Salvadorian. 
they've been married and living in Bethlehem for more than three years now and have two kids. Yet now she's illegally staying in the country, illegally staying in Palestine, in Bethlehem, Palestine, because her request for a Palestinian idea is not yet approved by Israel and she couldn't leave the country and for um, two reasons. She, in, in the system, like she needs to leave the country every two years and get approved for a tourist visa and come back in. She couldn't do that because she just had birth to, her, to their second child. And because of COVID travel restrictions three months ago, which uh, didn't allow her to travel and come back with always a risk of never being granted that uh, tourist visa to come back in. Um, so now she's staying illegally and she never knows when she's going to get her ID that restricts her from everything, from leaving anywhere outside of Bethlehem, from traveling, from seeing her family in Salvador, from taking her trips, uh, her, her kids to simple uh, trip around the country, because then she might get caught in one of the checkpoints and be deported back in Salvador and miss everything she's built with her husband here in Bethlehem. So Israel does follow the tactic of divide and conquer, making life impossible. Um, and sometimes it is. So more people would immigrate and just leave the country, making it easy to just take over. Um, but this is where Palestinian resilience and resistance take place. There are the traditional form of resistance, like pro protests, uh, marches, um, hunger strikes that prisoners uh, take, uh, work strikes, boycotts, which are often faced with shootings, tear gas bombs, and violence and home invasions by the Israelis, and do not end up being very peaceful anymore, peaceful sort of resistance. And there are other sorts of what I would call creative resistance that as Palestinians still perceive on, on doing, while Israel tries to make life impossible to continue still and cross the checkpoint to find work, or to find a living opportunity, or to go to schools like in Hebron and Tulkarim, where uh, kids have to walk and uh, risk the chance of getting harassed on the checkpoints, but to go and, and pursue education, that sort of, um, of uh, creative resistance. Or families who build homes despite being denied permits, knowing that they risk having their home destroyed and demolished, like in Welaje village, or Sheikh Jarrah, where they're, they're threatened of, uh, um, of leaving their houses and, um, uh, but, but yet, or of eviction, but yet their people are still living there, even if they had to share their, their homes with the settlers and they're forced to do that, they were, they're still going there and going to court to fight those orders and try to make a change because this is their home of, of generations and generations or villagers who remain on their land despite being denied access to water, electricity, health and education services and other basic needs like Tent of Nations, whom are under constant attacks, especially by settlers who try to evict their land, burn their crops, um, send sewage waters from the hills of settlements to their land. Yet they maintained there and they went to court trying to win um, the case of maintaining their basic right of existing in their own land. And that just takes us to what's going on in Gaza. As Omar said, it's an open air prison. It's the most dense population in the world. Um, they're, like, they're locked in, they cannot leave. Um, they, they even have restriction ac restricted access to water. They cannot fish even freely. They cannot plant and sell, uh, um, sell their goods even freely. Uh, access to clean water is not possible. Uh, 95 of the population don't get access to clean water. And there's still like ongoing uh, power shortages, which impacts essential uh, services like health, uh, sanitation, um, again, water. And so it, the, this blockade sealed Gaza off the rest of the world. I have never been to Gaza. I know I've barely met people, like I, maybe I've met I've met more Americans than I've met Palestinians who are from Gaza. It's that impossible for them to move. And it's impossible for me as a Palestinian to even go to Gaza 
I would need like a very special reason, very special permit with very special strings to pull. And I might even get denied access. Um, so the, last year, the war against uh, upon Gaza was there were those were the most horrific 11 days that were going on constantly bombing Gaza and completely wiping out Palestinian families, where, for example, uh, aiming bombs at refugee camps, wiping out all civilians where the only survivor is a few months old baby. How can anyone explain such a reality to that baby when, when that baby grows up and someone told, tells them like you're an orphan because your whole family got wiped out? How can that baby just have a normal life? Um, but it, it, it doesn't stop there. Killing and imprisoning Palestinian, Palestinian children, it's also happening. And one of Israeli's goals is to raise fear into the next coming generation, leading to subordination. Yet again, they try using the resources and the funds and the humanitarian funds they get access to, and they rely on 80% of humanitarian funds to continue living, yet to continue living in an open air prison. So those are examples of countless of unnamed people who refuse to accept and cooperate with discriminatory policies and laws. So they continue resisting. Um, and because of the continuous resistance of um, Palestinian population, of the Palestinian population, Israel has established a repressive system of control and relies on excessive use of force. Yes, yet us Palestinians, we are known for our resilience. And when we're gonna keep doing that, even though um, the stole, uh, stolen land and violence brought by settlers just adds to the mix of legal colonial settlers uh, who, are illegal, uh, who are easily making aliyah, like Omar said, I just uh, unfortunately met with someone who mentioned how surprised they've, they've chosen aliyah and they made it here into the country. Yet when she saw me, she told me she never realized how reality on ground is. She thought that this is a great deal. She will just take a flight from Brooklyn, New York, and come to Israel and build a life because she gets paid money, uh, gets offered a house, and she can just start freshly new when she didn't have great opportunities back home. Like she wasn't very happy with, the, she was living a mediocre life, but she found a great opportunity to live a great life. And then she was shocked to realize that this is on the expense of Palestinians and people and using their water, their resources, that this could have been a living opportunity for others. And now she's struggling with that uh, fact because no one tells her that when you're doing Aliyah, that's the consequence. That's what, how harmful it is to other people. Um, but yet settlers are, are a growing reality and settlers attack um, attack still uh, is an ongoing fact, and uh, they take have protection from the government, the Israeli government. They don't get persecuted for any attacks they do on Palestinian lands, like the Tent of Nations I just mentioned, and how they're constantly attacked. Or uh, Wadi Fukin is an, also another example of a village who is constantly attacked by um, by Israeli settler. And during the pandemic, some of the worst attacks happened when we are like the whole world is already like facing a crisis yet uh, they seize that opportunity to harm palestinians like on, on april uh, 2022 um, settlers were quarantined in an army base after they were suspected for contracting covid19 they've escaped and attacked palestinian civilians with stones and tear gas and set car on cars on fires the UN has reported concerns over excessive use of force by Israeli security forces and um, inconsistent protection measures to avoid spreading infection during operations such as those, but they still have impunity. And in, um, in a case in 2020, it was an only case that only happened once, but wolves were rela released from settlers to scar farmers and harm grazing animals as well. So those are just examples of how settlers 
um, like attack Palestinian villages and Palestinian population, making it impossible to live. But everything that's going on, the war on Gaza, uh, lack of resources, and Palestinians are speaking up. It's an opportunity to, as much as Israel is trying to divide and conquer Palestinians, our resistance and our resilience, it's, it can't be shrugged off. It's bringing more international attention and international pressure to just act towards Palestinian. And Palestinians are being more outspoken. We're trying more and more to use social media platforms, even though they're not being fair and sometimes there's high censorship. Yet we're trying to use them to unite, to be a unite front. And um, uh, there's a unity that we might have haven't, we haven't witnessed, I would say, in a while between Palestinians living on uh, in the 48 lands and between Palestinians in the West Bank because of how much attacks and especially the last war on Gaza that happened, of how much heartbroken it was, how much inhumane it was, that even um, everyone who's in the land just came united and were trying to hopefully end occupation and make our voices louder and louder. Wow, Arish, thank you so much. Um, you know, I will say it's often hard for me to hear these kind of stories, right? But I know it's a reality and I'm, it doesn't compare it to having to live through it. Um, so thank you for your courage and sharing all of that. And, you know, you talk about Palestinian resistance and trying to get the word out there. And I know you've done a lot of that yourself. So thank you for making this event part of that and helping to, to bring awareness to all of this. Um, and also making it very clear that these examples you've shared are not unique. Every Palestinian family has gone through at least one of these examples um, and can share their own stories. And you know that's that's why we are fighting for liberation and to end this occupation because it is inhumane and um, a lot of suffering is occurring as a result. So thank you, Arish. Um, a lot of what you said relates to what our next speaker, Samer, is going to talk about, which is the domestic implications of the occupation um, on U.S. policy and what's happening here. Um, one thing in particular, you mentioned impunity, Arij, and um, Israel operating with impunity. That is directly thanks to U.S. support of Israel and the occupation. So, um, Samer, I'm going to turn it over to you. I know there's a lot we can talk about, um, but maybe one of the places that we can start is how um, here in the U.S., uh, our support of Israel is leading to censorship, you know, BDS bills and, and, and the like, and how it's affecting our rights here. Over to you, Samer. Thank you, Hiba, and, and thank you for this opportunity. I always jump on the chance to come back to my alma mater to uh, speak to the students. Um, I look back at my four or five years uh, at VCU as very fondly, um, and um, I enjoyed them tremendously. And I, I try to go back as much as possible, although because of COVID that has not been possible recently. Um, I, 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 I want to start off by sort of uh, point out two things that um, one thing that uh, both uh, Omar and Arij uh, sort of alluded to, um, and this sort of idea of, of what the conflict is and what the conflict isn't. Um, our media likes to portray the conflict as sort of a, 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 a battle of civilizations, the East versus the West, uh, the Judeo-Christian versus uh, values versus Islamic values. Um, they, 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 they do this and then they say that, well, this has been going on for centuries and what are we going to do now? You know, we can't just end it within a couple of years. Now, both of those statements are just pat patently false. First and foremost, this is not a dispute of, of religion, of faiths. Um, this is not Jews and Christians versus uh, Muslims. OK, it has nothing to do with religion. It has all to do with the age-old battle of be, between land and resources. One people trying to, to take over a land and resources of another. That's what it's all about. Has nothing to do with faith. Faith is intertwined because uh, of, of the region we're talking about. This is, this, is, this is where the three major religions were, 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 were founded. So that's where the, the, the faith comes in. But but historically speaking, for centuries, Jews, 
Christians and Muslims lived within relatively pe relative peace within that region. It was this; these issues did not start occurring until the 18, 1900s. Prior to that, there there were really wasn't much conflict. In fact, if we look historically, it was, the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims banded together to fight off the the Crusaders because they understood that the Crusaders were there to harm them, all of them. They also joined together to 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 fight off the oppression of the Ottomans as well. So so this is this this whole thing that 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 this is a. Uh, 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 um, an age old, centuries old uh, battle is, is absolutely uh, false, um, but it is perpetuated by the media. So, so, so that's sort of one thing. Uh, the other thing is, and I think Arish talked about this, um, the Christian Palestinians and the Muslim Palestinians are treated exactly the same. We are no different. I myself am a Palestinian Christian. Yet when I tell people that, they, they, the first question they ask me, well, when did you convert? My response has always been about 2,000 years ago. So, so, so this, this idea that somehow Christianity is foreign to the Palestinian people is, is, is really ignorant. So, so I wanted to dispel those rumors. So we look back, historically speaking, um, again, um, we look at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the, mo the holiest site in Christianity. I don't know if you know this, but, but, but traditionally, historically, the keys to the church have been held by one Muslim family. And that every morning that Muslim family is responsibility is to go in and open the church up so that Christians can go in. And every evening they close and lock the gate, uh, the gates to the church and go home. And they, they safeguard that, that key. So people, so Christians, Muslims, and Jews have lived there in peace and tranquility for, for centuries. So, so this fight does not go back centuries. So, so, so I just want to kind of get that out of the way and, and talk about sort of the, the implications that, that, that we are now facing here. And a lot of the implications have to do with our First Amendment rights. Now, me as a Palestinian American, I have my own tragedy story. My tragedy story starts in 1948, where my grandfather had to basically take what he could carry on his back, take my, my, my father at the time and his other, his children, and run away. He ran away fearing reprisals from the Israeli militias, okay? That is my tragedy story. You may not like that. You may not agree with that. But you, what you do not have a right to is to criminalize that. You do not have a right to say that my tragedy story somehow is anti-Semitic or somehow I had, do not have a right to tell that story. And that's what we're seeing here across college campuses, across our government, across our entire nation. So I'll give you, I'll give you an example. We had a case uh, that came out of uh, New Jersey uh, and um, a, a New Jersey grammar school had asked its students to put presentations and show displays of their uh, ethnicity and their heritage and where they came from. Well, a Palestinian uh, child decides, of course, he's gonna do a, a display on Palestine one of the things he displayed, and he was a, he was a, we call, we refer to as a 1948 refugee, meaning his parents had fled in 1948. One of the things he decided to, to display was a map, an, a, a historical map uh, of, of Palestine, a pre-1948 map, and that map did not include uh, the state of Israel, because prior to that, there was no state of Israel. Another student, uh, who was a Jewish American student, um, she decided that she was going to also do a, a, a presentation of the state of Israel. And she presented a very similar map. That map showed Israel, but did not show the occupied territories. It did not delineate what was Palestine, what was Israel. Well, uh, at the assembly, somebody outside the school who was there complained to the school and said that, that the Palestinian child's uh, display was anti-Semitic because it did not show Israel, even though it was a historical map. That child was punished. That child was disciplined. Yet the, the, yet the Jewish child who showed the exact same map was not. Okay, so it goes back to this idea of 
that we are going to censor this. And this idea that, that, that people are, 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 have put forth that because people are expressing their Palestinianness or people are identifying as Palestinian, that somehow that's undermining Israel or somehow that's anti-Semitic. I have a right to identify as Palestinians. Because those so, same people that are saying that uh, that 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 are undermining uh, that are saying that I am undermining um, the uh, the Jewish identity, the Israeli identity, by by claiming I'm Palestinian, are the same people that deny that there is a Palestine or deny that there is even even is such a thing as a Palestinian people. So to me, I find it extremely racist when people equate the Palestinian movement or equate the Palestinian flag. To white nationalism, uh, to white supremacy, or to a cross burning, or to the swastika, because that's what people are doing. They're saying that by displaying the flag of Palestine, that somehow I'm being anti-Semitic, and we're seeing this this happen all over the place. We're seeing it um, in, in in laws that are being passed. So now we, of course, we have this movement, what's, what's called BDS, boycott, divest, and sanction. Um, and, 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 and people are saying that, that this, this movement is anti-Semitic and that we need to outlaw this movement. The problem is, is, is that this Supreme Court, and this dates back to the bus boycotts of the civil rights era, the Supreme Court has declared boycotts as inherently a First Amendment protective activity. OK, so if somebody wants to boycott the state of Israel, somebody wants to boycott a bus, if somebody wants to boycott Ben and Jerry's, they can do so. That is their First Amendment right. But we are seeing states come out with laws outlawing it. So, for example, the state of Texas passed a law stating that all state employees must take an oath that they will not criticize the state of Israel and they will not engage in a boycott of the state of Israel. Now take a, take a minute and, and digest that. The state of Texas passed a law and it's, it's not, it's not, it's happened all over basically saying you in order to take a job with the state of Texas must promise never to criticize a foreign state. OK, and we see these laws being passed all over. the. And quite honestly, these laws are nothing more than than pure political statements on the ha on, on, uh, on, uh, on on these uh, uh, politicians, because every single law that has been challenged has been defeated, has been turned away by this by, by the courts because they're obviously against First Amendment rights. So we see them on college campuses where, 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 where student organizations are becoming are, are starting to become outlawed. There's a case out of uh, out of Fordham University where they have outlawed uh, a, a group called the Students for Justice in Palestine. Why? Because they have the nerve, the audacity to advocate on behalf of a free Palestine. What we are also seeing now, which is I think, which is outrageous, is the head of the ADL just came out and said that they're going to target Palestinian solidarity organizations. Okay. So if you are an organization that shows solidarity to Palestine, the ADL has now equated you as a white supremacist, as a, as a right-wing extremist. Why? Because you are showing solidarity with the Palestinian people. To me, I, I think that's outrageous in a country where we prize our First Amendment. Now, the one thing I used to remember at VCU is, is the openness of the debates we used to have. I remember... Uh, especially during the summer months, we used to sit out in, in front of the student commons. There used to be an individual who used to come, uh, you know, every once in a while, and he used to carry this huge wooden cross. And he would walk across the college campus with this huge wooden cross, and students would debate them. We, we, we would engage with them. We would debate them. This, uh, but this now notion of that we have to protect our students, that we can't teach students about subjects that may make them feel uncomfortable. Again, this was the same, same sort of argument we saw against the critical race theory. That we have to be careful how we talk about the slave trade in the United States because, because it might make a, a white man, a white child feel uncomfortable. Here's the thing. 
History is uncomfortable. Okay? History is meant to be taught in a way that we learn from our mistakes and we learn not to do things. So if we continue to worry about how students feel when we're teaching them about an uncomfortable subject, then we might as well just give up teaching history. How do you teach, how do you teach about the slave trade without possibly making a white student nervous or uncomfortable? How do you teach about the Holocaust without making a Jewish student feel uncomfortable or, 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 or feel ashamed? We need to address these head on and we need to talk about history in an honest and truthful manner so that we do not repeat history. And, and, and that is the biggest problem. The last thing I wanna sort of talk, talk about is again, is this the dichotomy uh, between uh, treatment of Palestinians and treatment uh, uh, of Israelis. Uh, and, this and this sort of extends to um, uh, uh, American Palestinians. So for example, right now, um, American uh, Palestinians of America, uh, excuse me, Americans of Palestinian descent are just also discriminated when they go to Israel. And I'll give you another example. A good friend of mine, who's also a Palestinian Christian, um, every year goes back for Easter. Now he is a U.S. citizen. He was born in the West Bank. His wife is a U.S. citizen. She was born in Jerusalem. His kids are U.S. citizens and they were born in the United States. As a family, they cannot travel back to Israel together. Okay? My friend, because he was born in the West Bank, is not allowed to travel through the airport in Tel Aviv and must first go to Jordan and cross the border from Jordan into the West Bank. He is not allowed to go into Jerusalem or into Israel proper, even, even traveling under his US passport. His wife is allowed to go to, through Tel Aviv, is allowed to go to Jerusalem, okay? Their kids, as of right now, are allowed to travel through Tel Aviv. Um, but if the kids get their Palestinian identity, they would then be barred from traveling through Tel Aviv and then would have to travel through, um, through, um, through, through Jordan. Even though they're US citizens, even though they're traveling under, under on the US passport. Now, Israel just came out with new laws now, before a Palestinian American, Palestinian American is allowed to travel, they must declare themselves as Palestinian. They must notify the Israeli government of everywhere they're going to travel. They must identify every single family member that they have in Palestine or in Israel. They must give them their addresses of every single family member they have. And oh, by the way, that still doesn't get you into, into the country. And you could still be denied, which happens quite often. To, to Americans of Palestinian descent. So I think, I think I, I know I've gone through a lot. I think I'll just end it there because I really do want to leave time for question and answer. So um, Hiba, I, I throw it back to you. Yeah, thank you, Samer. Thank you for those remarks. And, um, you know, I think part of um, what you've been alluding to is, you know, the, the censorship of Palestinians talking about um, our lives, our experiences and advocating for Palestinians. And, you know, you, you mentioned um, how that's being undermined, right, by folks who are trying to equate us to white supremacist movements and things like that, which is, you know, just not true, but it's sort of this um, desperation of trying to undermine Palestinian rights and our histories that leads to that kind of rhetoric and those uh, false equivalencies, because as has been um, talked about a little bit here, um, there has been some new movement in supporting Palestinian liberation um, and where we're going as um, as a people and making sure that we're supporting that. So in this um, last section, we are running a little bit behind. So um, probably we'll have to keep it abbreviated, but I do wanna make sure that we tell folks what actions they can take to support the Palestinian movement for liberation and to end the Israeli occupation of Palestine. Um, so Samara, if you could start by touching on um, what is the best way for people who live in a state with a BDS bill, an anti-BDS bill, what is the best way for them to push back on that? And are there organizations you want to name specifically in just a couple minutes here that we might be able to look to to support? Okay, okay real quick, um, the, the bills haven't passed um, in, in every state. And, and again, um, I, I tell people you have a right to boycott, you have a right not to boycott, that, that, that's up to you. 
what the government does not have a right to say to you is to say that you cannot boycott. If I choose not to buy uh, Sabra Hamos because of the way Palestinians are treated by Israelis, that's my choice. I have a right to do that. If Ben and Jerry's, and by the way, let's just go back to the Ben and Jerry's real quick. You know, Ben and Jerry's decided that they were going to pull out of the settlements, not out of Israel. Okay. And all of a sudden now they're being attacked. Governments are being pushed to sort of divest out of out of the, the Ben and Jerry's. Ben, people in Israel can still buy Ben and Jerry's. You can still go to Tel Aviv and get Ben and Jerry's in a, in a market. If you live in a settlement, all you have to go is to Tel Aviv, buy it and go back to the settlements. That's okay. Okay. The, the entire world has not ended. Um, but, but, but this idea that even an inch of showing sympathy towards Palestinians somehow is anti-Semitic. So I think one of the things you can do real quickly is to contact your local elected official to tell them that, 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 that you're supportive of, a Palest of, of Palestinians, no matter how it's done, either through boycott or through other means, is legal and must be protected. There are groups out there that, that, that do it. Our group, uh, ADC, has one that, that, that's been advocating on, on behalf of, of the right to boycott. There's a group called Palestine Legal, which is connected to the Center for, uh, for Constitutional Rights. They, they've brought a lot of litigation towards it. And there are other student groups, uh, groups such as uh, SJP, Students for Justice in Palestine, which is a, a college campus uh, organization um, started to, to, to show solidarity Palestinians. And, and I think a really important group is a group called If Not Now, which is a group that was started by uh, Jewish American students and advocates on behalf of, of, of Palestinian rights and on behalf of the right to boycott as well. So those are organizations that, that, that you can join and support um, to, uh, to at least express your feeling that we need to protect the First Amendment rights no matter where you fall on the issue. Thank you, Sam. I really appreciate that. Um, and a lot of these organizations also organize direct actions, um, which, as you know, is a great way to bring attention to issues that are happening um, and to also sign people up when they're there, right? Come mm -hmm. show up with your sign, but then sign up to volunteer to talk to people or to make calls. So I think these are all really good suggestions. And I'll also note that I um, maybe we'll try to send out these suggestions and resources after the event as well. So Tiana, I'll touch base with you on that. Um, but I want to pivot now to Arij, who um, can share with us some humanitarian organizations um, in Palestine that would be uh, helpful to support as they're fighting against the occupation and also supporting people in Palestine. Uh, yes, thank you, Hiba. There is the PNGO net. Uh, which summarize some of the local organizations. We can maybe also send their link, Hiba, with the resources uh, that cover a few organizations that are in Palestine and work on ground um, and do effective, uh, effective work. Um, but also there's um, small initiatives that help Palestinian people. Uh, there's Qawarib. It's a small, it's a very small, they only have a Facebook page, very small organization and like, um, it's a movement of, uh, of young people mostly that go to, from house to house and help and support people who need any sort of humanitarian aid. Um, something sometimes as basic as blankets, as uh, food, as wheelchairs. Uh, I've worked with them before and they've, they've done amazing in how they recruit their people and just go out and, and just help our own people and just be there and hear their needs and um, usually it's self-funded, um, Palestinians uh, gather funds and support those needs, but it's always good to know about small initiatives and how big impact they have. Um, but also look, look into organizations that do create life in such, an, in such a difficult environment as well. Um, maybe they don't identify for other people as humanitarian aid, but something, for example, like the Natural History Museum in Bethlehem uh, helps me, for example, I have a community garden there because of the limited resources, limited land, it's a place I can go and live in Palestinian nature because it's that much restricted and that's much how much movement is restricted, but they still maintain and preserve Palestinian nature and bring it together in one place and try to do um, great work uh, with the resources they have. Or through music, as uh, there are, uh, there's this group called Amwaj Palestine, which means waves Palestine, and they've challenged cultures where music was not very acceptable to start learning music 
and now they're going to France this summer to go play uh, as an orchestra and uh, present. Again, those are all opportunities that bring life. And it, it depends on if this is sort of organizations that depends on your interest, you can look into and maybe explore more in ways maybe you can get involved, maybe volunteer, maybe support, maybe just let other people know about. Thank you so much. And I, I love that beautiful addition of, you know, arts and culture, because you're absolutely right. Um, we should be supporting those as well. Thank you. Um, I'll briefly mention uh, mutual aid efforts. Um, so I often see online people are, are being contacted by folks in Palestine who say, I need X amount of dollars for medical care or to purchase certain things. Um, a lot of those are um, checked by the folks who are facilitating them and collecting the money. So just also want to put in a pitch for that, that if you see mutual aid requests to directly help people, that is another way that we can be supporting Palestinians um, under occupation. Um, lastly, I'm going to turn it over to Omar because, you know, this event, if you, this is your first time learning about Palestine, we don't want it to be the end of your education journey. So Omar, are there, um, you know, different places people can turn to, whether it's social media or elsewhere to continue their education? Sure. Um, on the education front, uh, there are many organizations that do terrific work on educating about the reality of what's happening in Palestine. And that's really important because we have a media scene that is a little bit complicated in the United States. Uh, we don't get the information that we need to be getting to understand the situation well. Um, and social media has changed that. We're seeing videos directly from Palestinians on the ground that are being posted on um, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. And that's a way that people can access this stuff is just by following activists who are living on the ground. Um, a couple of really important ones are Muhammad Al-Kurd and Muna Al-Kurd. Um, Muhammad Al-Kurd was recently named um, in Time Magazine as one of the most influential people of last year. Um, they There's an effort by Israel to throw them out of their homes in East Jerusalem, and they're fighting back against that. Um, there is organizations like the Institute for Middle East Understanding, the IMEU, which I work with, um, that I think does an absolutely terrific job. There is a group out of Gaza called We Are Not Numbers um, that does kind of a, a sort of a, a, a look to humanize Palestinians who are living in Gaza and get a sense of what their lives are actually like. Um, and honestly, for the United States, beyond just education, become politically involved. That's, that's really where the fight is and where it's most important is that there is increasingly a shift in public discourse where it's becoming more and more okay to be critical of Israeli policy and to demand uh, a change in American policy in support of justice. And I really think that it's important for people to organize, to vote, to support candidates who are outspoken on this issue. And on the media front, to write to your media, be it local or national, when their coverage is bad, demand that the coverage be better, demand that context be provided, and demand that Palestinian voices be present when the discussion is happening about what is happening in Palestine. Um, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, Omar. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left. I think um, we want to have an opportunity for our speakers to have final remarks. Um, but at this point in time, I wonder if Tiano, you could reopen the chat. So if folks have questions, please drop them in the chat as we're giving final remarks, um, if you have any. So Omar, I'm actually going to start with you if that's okay. Um, anything you want to add here? Honestly, I'll keep it super brief. I just know that there has been some reaction to this event where some people were claiming that um, this event is not okay because incendiary language is going to put um, you know, Jewish students at risk. I want to be absolutely clear about the fact that anti-Semitism is a real and rising problem in America and across the world and one that should be taken seriously. It's not, it's not a light thing at all. Um, we have, especially during the Trump era, an increase in shootings at synagogues. All of this stuff is very, very serious. Equally serious is the importance of not conflating a political issue about Israel's oppression of Palestinians with this. And I don't think that everybody does that on purpose. Some people just, you know, I get how this can become an emotionally complicated issue for some. But when it comes to Israel's mistreatment of Palestinians, that is a fact that is documented by every human rights organization. And this, frankly, incredibly distasteful to exploit something as serious and heavy as anti-Semitism to try to stifle discussion about Palestinian human rights. Um, that's not only harmful, by the way, to the Palestinians who are being smeared as anti-Semitic, but it's also harmful to the fight to protect the Jewish community from real anti-Semitism. Um, because when you water down that charge by lobbying it loosely at people who advocate for human rights, people start taking that charge less seriously. And that is obviously harmful at a time when we should be taking anti-Semitism very, very seriously. So just wanted to note that in closing and um, yeah, thank you again to everybody who made this event possible and I'm looking forward to 
uh, whatever questions students will have. Thank you, Omar. Um, really important clarification, so I appreciate that. Um, Samer and Arish, do you have any um, final remarks? And just note for people, I see some hands raised. Please go ahead and use the chat to ask questions. You can also directly message me if you want it to be more private. Um, but uh, Samer or Arish? Yeah, I just want to sort of um, you know echo a lot what uh, what Omar just said. I, I think uh, you know anti-Semitism is is, is a is a real is a true and and terrifying and, and actual problem that we have in this country. Um, some, uh, you know, some that we also, uh, as Arab Americans, um, fight as well and 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 denounce. Um, and I want to sort of make a a, clear, uh, a distinction between criticism of the state of Israel versus the criticism uh, of the Jewish faith and Jewish people. Um, when when I when we criticize the policies of, of Israel, we are criticizing a country. And, and its policies and its treatment of others, okay? That has nothing whatsoever to do with the Jewish faith. Um, and I am not criticizing the Jewish faith um, uh, uh, because I know Jews have, have been, uh, you know, extremely uh, involved in the civil rights movement throughout this country. Um, and, and that's very admirable and, that's, and they've done some great work. Um, and so when we talk about boycotting, we're not talking about boycotting uh, Jewish people or Jewish faith. We are talking about boycotting a country because of their treatment uh, of a minority within, within their borders. That's simply, simply if I boycott a, 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 an Israeli product or a company is doing, doing business in Israel, I'm boycotting it because there are, they are enabling the oppression of my people, not because of any specific faith or religion that that individuals have. So I, I think that's an important distinction that needs to be made. Thank you, Samer. Um, Arish, any final remarks? I would just add my voice to uh, what Omar and Samer said. I strongly agree with the distinguish between the Jewish faith uh, that is a very ancient and distinct and, and a respectful faith and anti-Semitism and the state of Israel. Like those are all different uh, than what we're talking about here, right here. But I also like to point out that it's like after everything we've discussed, after everything we've said, that this is the time and the, the need and we're bringing attention to the need to prove that international law and international human rights are consistently and fairly implemented in all unjust circumstances and to all people without impunity. And I would summarize everything I've, everything with that. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, really appreciate all of your insights. Um, we have about five minutes left and I do see some questions coming through in the chat. So um, I'll take this first one from Haley who is asking if there will be um, any follow-up information to this event. Um, yes, we will make sure to send out some follow-up information that includes um, you know, some of the notes and also ways that you can um, get involved with supporting this. Um, looking at this next set of questions from Ariel, um, you know, I'm just going to be honest, a lot of this feels like bait to me, I'm trying to get us in a corner. So the one thing I will say before I turn it over to Omar is, um, you know, we mentioned that the UN gives Gaza 1.4 billion in aid um, from 2014 to 2021, we still give 3.8 billion in aid annually as the US to Israel to do this. Um, and so I, I often think that when we talk about aid and what money is going there, we have to acknowledge that, that humanitarian aid would not be needed if we weren't giving military aid and other things to Israel to continue doing this. But um, I'm not the expert here, so I'm going to see if Omar has any interest in addressing any part of this. Look, I'll, have, I'll just, I'll say two things about this. One is on the question of Israel having completely left Gaza, that is simply not true. It's just, it, we should be very clear about the language that we're using. Israel withdrew settlers from inside of Gaza. However, Israel continues to occupy Gaza because it controls every border of Gaza. It's uh, Palestinians in Gaza are not allowed to have an airport. Why not? Because Israel doesn't allow them to. Palestinians in Gaza can't have a seaport. Why not? Because Israel does not allow them to. So the people in Gaza are very much still occupied by Israel and Israel very much still controls their lives. They can't leave Gaza because of Israel. They can't trade with the outside world because of Israel. So their lives are completely suffocated 
because of Israeli policy. Not to mention, of course, what we've talked about already, which, there, which are the successive Israeli bombings in Gaza that don't discriminate between Palestinian civilians and military targets, as documented by Human Rights Watch and B'Tselem and Amnesty International and United Nations Human Rights Reports, and the list goes on and on. But more critically, I think the point that you mentioned is that when we talk about humanitarian aid going to Gaza, it is literally because the humanitarian crisis is created by Israel. So at the end of the day, I'm not a huge fan of Hamas. I don't agree. I'm not here to defend everything that Hamas does. But at the end of the day, we are talking about a situation in which there are unoppressed people who require, who are requiring aid because they're being oppressed. And ultimately, Palestinians are not victims of a natural disaster who are in need of charity. They are victims of oppression who are in need of freedom from Israeli oppression and occupation. And that's what we should be focusing on. And of course, for us, for Americans, if the US was sending billions in weapons to Hamas, then by all means, we can sit down here and have a conversation about where that money is going. But we as Americans are sending weapons by the billions to the Israeli military, and the Israeli military is committing state terrorism with those weapons targeting civilians. And that's what we should be talking about, because this is where our money is going, and this is where our moral responsibility actually comes in. Thank you, Omar. Um, I see a few more questions coming through the chat, um, but at this point, all uh, if I, can, can I just add, respond also one other thing to that question? Because there's, there, there's, there's one part of that question that I, I kind of found a little insulting um, in the idea of, well, we, we can't give Palestinians their freedom because of a fear of a failed state uh, in Palestine. Well, if you want to use that argument, uh, and, and it's interesting is that argument also was used uh, to, to, to argue against giving women the right to vote. Why should we give the women the right to vote? Because they're not going to exercise it properly. Why should we give uneducated people the right to vote? Because they're not educated and, they're and we need to protect them. Well, you know, I have a solution. If, 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 if Israel is so fearful of a failed state on their borders, hey, there's one easy solution. That's a one state solution. All right. Give everybody living within Palestine and Israel equal rights and equal, uh, equal right to vote. One man, one person, one vote. Let them decide their future and create one country for everybody. There, that way, you don't have to worry about a failed state on your border. Ta All right. Thanks, Samer, for the addition there. Um, we are at time, um, and the questions coming through are not being posed in good faith. So we're going to wrap this up. Um, but thank you all for being here, for those of you who decided to attend this uh, event to learn and to be genuinely curious about what's happening. Um, really appreciate it. We will have, again, a follow-up sent out with information that you can use uh, to support Palestinian liberation and the movement here in the U.S. and in Palestine. So thank you again. Really appreciate it. Thank you to our speakers, to the VCU OMSA office, to the Lebanese Student Association and the Muslim Student Association. We appreciate all of you. Um, thank you so much, and we'll be in touch.